Hello, everybody. I'm here today with John Bates. John Bates is a bit of a rare beast for us here in, in England. He is a Brit that has actually grown and developed four software companies and sold them. Three to US organizations, a one-to-one -one German company. Thank you very much for joining me, John. Why don't you tell me a little bit about those organizations? Well, pleasure to be here, pleasure to be Ruby. And yeah, I um and I've I've not just uh I've not just worked in those companies and development, but I've also spent over a decade working in the public companies that acquired them. And uh, so, you know, sat sat on both sides of the uh of the fence. But yeah, I've I started off actually as an academic and and my first company, I left, I developed some research. I got a PhD in computer science at the University of Cambridge. I left to develop a company called Palmer, which was some of my research. It became the first company in the space. It's now called Streaming Analytics, which is applying machine learning techniques to find patterns in fast moving data and act on them very quickly. And we applied that to the rise of algorithmic trading and uh, selling to hedge funds and, and trading organizations, banks that wanted to rapidly plug together trading strategies that could find patterns in the market. Um, and so that was, that was a, a great company. It was sold to a US uh, public company, uh, but I, I went, called Progress Software, I went there for a number of years. I moved to the US actually, so I spent most of my career in the US um, and uh, I became ended up becoming CTO and head of M and A at, at, at Progress. Um, and you know, I, I subsequently went went to another public company called Software AG, which uh, which which you you may know. But I I I, um, I left to to start a uh, an Internet of Things company called uh, Plat One, um, and that was all about how can you build Internet of Things applications and manage them at runtime very scalably. And uh, that, that, uh, that was in the, on the West Coast, by this time being in Silicon Valley, sold that to uh, uh, SAP. So, you know, I, I, I love to work with uh, German companies, I think. And, um, and uh, most recently, I have um, was in a CEO of a company called Eggplant, and Eggplant became a leader in intelligent software test automation. We sort of reinvented that industry a little bit, um, and um, by applying AI to that uh, that space, so that rather than the old world of building test scripts, this uh, company could intelligently analyze your digital products and actually build the tests automatically for you to provide much more rapid time to market to keep up with the pace uh, that's needed for continuous delivery and to radically improve quality as well as testing the customer experience and business outcomes and that was acquired um, in june last year by a company called keysight technologies now i moved back to the uk to do that so i ended up back in back in the uh uk but sort of having grown up in in the us Thank you for that. So that, I mean, that's a great, interesting sort of overview of your background. And I think it puts you uh, firmly in poor position to sort of go through and answer some of the questions. Because what I want to talk to about talk to you about is the future of software and what are the opportunities ahead for us um, yeah. here in the UK. Um, so where I'd probably like to start off with is uh, a statement and then a question. So Industrial Revolution started here in the UK. Software, yep. a little known fact, started here in the UK. The computer created here in the UK. The internet created here in the UK. Why do we create all these fantastic things and never manage to hold on to the crown jewels? Why haven't we created some of those massive, stellar international software companies? What prohibits us? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I, I will just clarify. I think the internet. I'll give the US that one, but the web, which is really the the thing that enabled the internet to become what it is, was uh, you know, of course, Tim Berners Lee from from the UK. So I think that's that's all fair. And yeah, 
who knew that the UK invented the first computer and because it was classified for 50 years. But there you go. Um, so the UK has got amazing innovation. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Where the UK has lost its way since the Industrial Revolution is in commercialising that. Uh, but I think we could be at the cusp of, of all of that changing. And I see tremendous opportunities for the UK, although, you know, there are pros and cons of setting up a business here. But so as you know, Ruby, because you see this every day, the market for tech is hot. Um, private equity has a lot of money to invest and too few properties to invest in. Um, and the UK tech scene, I mean, particularly in fintech, but in other areas, is growing and London's popular location to be based. But most notably for me um, is the fact that Joe Biden is about to make, I think, a big mistake uh, with his tax plan. And he is about to implement a capital gains tax or try to implement if he gets it through, but there's no reason why he shouldn't with the majority has implement a capital gains um, tax increase, which will put it to almost 50% for, for many high earners for anything over a million dollars. So if you're going to, you know, make 10 million, 20 million in, you know, developing an asset and selling it, maybe some of your colleagues make 3 million, 4 million, Suddenly, you're paying 50% tax on that instead of 20 or 23.8 or whatever it is um, currently. Now, if you're a UK-based expat in the US, why wouldn't you come back to the UK and pay 20% and build your company here? Because the scene has been developing. The scene in the UK is looking pretty good. It's not a bad place to be. So I think we might see a reverse brain drain about to happen. I do hope so. That'll be um, a fantastic coup for uh, Europe and definitely the UK. I mean, looking at the US software industry, what learnings do you identify for UK and Western Europe to offer more sustainable platform for growth for these companies right now? Yeah, I, for sure. Well. It's not just about you know what 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 environment we have because I think we actually have a pretty good environment. I think there's a uh, certainly in the UK there's a reasonably good you know tax framework for for you know capital gains as I say maybe not so good in in some places better in others uh, in Europe but I think it's more about you know attitudinal changes in Europe that needs to happen. Because, I mean, I am a massive fan of US, the US way of doing business. And it's, I think we just need to get into that mojo in, in, in Europe if we want to make scalable uh, businesses. You know, as I say, the UK, for example, has amazing technology innovations. The universities are amazing. The heritage is brilliant. Um, as you pointed out yourself, um, and we, I think we're great at that, but we suck at sales and marketing. So the US is awesome at sales and marketing, and it's pretty good at technology as well. But they maximize that technology with product marketing. So they tell the right story. Um, so, you know, if there's going to be a reverse brain drain, hopefully we'll get some 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 talent back in this area. But, you know, look at it. The UK and places in Europe, it's not horribly expensive outside of London in the UK for tech talent. Um, but this attitudinal thing as well. The US is amazing in terms of its attitude. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Um, you know, it's I, you know, I compare Silicon Valley to the UK, sometimes cynical valley, you know, with, oh, that'll never work, mate, that'll never work. Whereas, you know, in the US, they'll make it work. And so if we don't believe, we will fail. And we have to 
have a mission and we have to believe. And this is one of the reasons why we end up selling out too early often. So I think the UK has to embrace vision, which is the most important ingredient of a software company, um, which is, you know, what the likes of Elon Musk and Bill Gates had and Larry Ellison had and Steve Jobs had. And they're all unbelievable um, product marketers. They understand market, product, go to market. And that's what we need here. So if anything, I'd like to see more universities really getting strong on, on this and there being a culture uh, of this in the UK. That's that's uh, really insightful. And yes, going back to that point, a lot of those fantastic leaders um, of great big tech companies have come from a product marketing background. And I don't see too much of that here in the UK um, or actually that much across Europe. And that, I think that's definitely one key lesson we can learn when trying to build the leadership team for a tech company that needs to scale at pace. But one of the questions I'm going to ask you, culturally speaking, what do you think other geographies other than the US do well uh, that you would encourage across the UK software industry, apart from this great can-do attitude that the US has? I mean, what other elements do you think uh, we should sort of be pulling through as well? Yeah, I mean, I think... Germany is a very interesting um, geography. So I'm the chairman of a, of a, of a private equity backed German headquartered uh, software company. And Germany has, I think, you know, you can draw an analogy with Mercedes and BMW and the way they're sold, for example, in the US market. So US people aspire to have a Mercedes or a BMW because they see it as quality German engineering. And let's face it, they're right. So I think that quality engineering, that's part of the brand of German software as well. It's it's well engineered and um, that's maybe an advantage it has, say, over US software. Um, and um, so I think, you know, we've, we, we want to borrow from the US um that 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 cultural piece of of uh being vision and product marketing led um and having the story and everything coming down to the story um but i think you know if we if we also can can have some other aspects of 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 our brand being quality quality engineering and you know if you go out to some cultures in asia you know i I work been you know working with Keysight Technologies that has a big presence in Malaysia, for example. Those folks work super hard, uncomplainingly, you know. And you know, some would say that the uh, uh, perhaps there's something a bit of uh, you know prima donna, you know, complaining y type culture in the in the in the millennials. Oh well, you know, am I going to get a, am I going to get you know lunch? served in the office uh, and dinner will there be a foosball table you know the folks in malaysia are, they're they're killing it they're and they're they're getting on and they're and they're pushing um themselves forward so i think if you can if you can get a a combo of you know good vision good work ethic and 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 sort of a brand around quality engineering you're not you're not far off thank you john and just on that same vein, you've also had lots of exposure to investors. So from the investors that you've worked with previously, what have you seen work well and what would you yeah. like to see more of? Yeah, I mean, in companies I've worked with, I've worked with venture capital, angel investors, private equity, and I work with public companies. So I've worked for a number of public companies as well as I'm on the board of the UK's biggest um, listed tech company, Sage. So I, for myself, in terms of um, setting, you know, being involved in um, the executive side of a company, I like private equity because everyone's interests kind of are aligned um, and, you know, they're aligned in maximizing the value of an asset over a period of time. Um, 
And, you know, in my case, I've worked with one particular firm three times now. Um, and that's the Carlisle Group with their technology fund. And I use them as an example. I mean, I like them because they're a known quantity. Uh, I've worked with the co-head there, Michael Wong, for, you know, 20 years. Um, he's tough, but he's honest. I know him. Um, and he's brilliant at spotting diamonds in the rough and turning them into great companies. Uh, and he actually understands the market, products and people. And I think we need more of those skills in Europe. I mean, too many of these financial firms are just, you know, financial engineering, right? Let's buy that. Let's put that together. Let's sell that. There's no thought. And so I can apply the same principles around understanding markets, products and people to to these firms and and, and Michael and, and the Carlisle team do. And I think, you know, in, in our case, you know, when they backed me most recently at Eggplant, you know, they they backed me to come in and do what was necessary to transform that business. And um, we transformed the vision, the messaging, the products, the go-to-market strategy. You know, as I say, we applied AI uh, to the space of software test automation rather than, you know, antiquated approach of building test scripts. And, um, and um, we put the right go-to-market strategy in place with a solution oriented go to market and uh we built the right product uh, platform and carlisle was rewarded for this um, when eggplant was acquired after three and a half years for you know 10 times its value when i arrived um and i i do feel for example you know seeing publicly listed companies if we compare that particularly in the uk they have a disadvantage compared to private equity, because if we want to do that kind of transformation, and if we want to have amazing public software companies, um, they don't get a chance because everything they do is out in the open. Um, and I think you've got to give management teams a chance to execute and take risks and even make mistakes. Um, and, um, you know, we can't all be fast growth, high profit and highly predictable. Um, and you know, the UK has to embrace software a little more. Um, and, you know, you've got to embrace the concept that it's OK to fail uh, as long as we adapt quickly, I think, and uh, and learn. I think that's super important. And the UK also has to adopt the fact that it's OK to make money because, you know, in the UK, it seems where it's OK. It's not OK to fail, but it's not OK to be too successful. Um, and that's got to change because it is OK to fail and it is OK to be too successful. <laughs> well, I take it from what you say, you're a, um, a strong advocate for growing and um, scaling up and even back in the concept of hopefully the next decade are seeing, you know, one of the largest software companies in the UK, globally being existing in the UK. So on that point, you've sold companies just out of curiosity why did you sell them and not grow them further and scale them into a mammoth beast yeah well that's a great question i feel super guilty about this actually um you know for each of those businesses there were reasons and we honestly thought eggplant which is the most recent would go all the way and, you know, we more than tripled the revenue in three years from when I joined, um, made it highly profitable and increase its value, as we talked about. Um, but the really cool thing was that there was that vision for next generation intelligent test automation. So I think it had a lot of runway um, to to go on. Um, it was no by no means done. Um, and we didn't. We didn't launch a sale process for that. I had for two years private equity knocking on my door going, oh, you've become a leader in Gartner and Forrester. Oh, you're one of the few properties that's got scale. Oh, we really like what you're doing. Would you like to sell? And, you know, eventually we got started to get, you know, these interesting uh, protestations of love that, we, you know, we decided to sort of, you know, test the water. It was a good market. And see what was happening, but with the intention being of selling to the next size up private equity, uh, because we were at a point 
where it was a growing pain, we'd we'd reached a certain, you know, we'd gone from sort of, you know, 10 to, to 40 in um in a short period of time in terms of revenue or ARR. And now it was about going to 100 and 200 in the next phase through more aggressive M&A and, you know, more aggressive sort of growth strategies. And to do that, probably it would involve bringing in more talent and restructuring um, as well as having more, um, you know, a fund with more money in order to a larger scale to, to invest. So that was one of the reasons why we thought it was a good time, plus the market was good. And so in that kind of circumstance, you can take money off the table a little bit, but stay in as well. So that's, you know, ideal. So that's what was expected. Now, in the case of eggplant, um, it (laughs) uh, wouldn't you believe it? I thought I'd got everything perfect for once. But then uh, we got these offers in. We had a few handpicked sort of in a pre-process, private equity and a couple of strategics, had some great offers, and then COVID happened. And just, it was like, you know, the world froze. And so I thought, well, that's the end of that. I'm just getting on with running the business. And we had no idea what to expect, but we went back to running the business. And in fact, our business improved, um, believe it or not. And we started getting ahead of budget because suddenly, Everybody had to accelerate their digital journey, which was highly unexpected. And we didn't think anybody would pay us, but everybody did, actually. It was fine. And I know many businesses had the same experience. Some poor folks exposed to travel and transportation. I mean, it's a nightmare for them. But we were lucky. Um, and But the private equity firms, they just went away and they were very slow coming back. And Keysight Technology, which was the strategic, once they got themselves up and running, back with a compelling offer. And it was one of those things where we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know what's going to happen. Do we take the bird in the hand? Um, And I had a young team. And that young team, I thought, could benefit from being inside a big company and experiencing that for their resumes. So while that mission was over, a new mission would begin. And so I agreed with Carlisle we would take that offer, um, although with some regret on the point of view that you're taking away that that amazing independent company. But it really came down to the fact that private equity firms, they were too timid coming back. And boy, did they regret it afterwards um, when the market suddenly shot back up and probably we we should have waited but hindsight's 2020 isn't it so that that's the story but i would advise anybody who is um you know who is part of a journey where they want to continue you can have your cake and eat it you can take something off the table and stay in thank you john one question i'd also like to ask you i mean having gone through you've gone through as i said four exits um, each of them, you know, varying level of success, notching up slightly more every time. Um, if, if I was a CEO sitting out there of a software business um, who hasn't experienced my first success, or I have experienced first success and I'm on something that's got the opportunity to grow like the clappers, um, what advice would you give me? And is there anything you would have done differently in your experiences? Wow. Um, well, one always looks back and thinks, I'd wish I'd done that differently. I wish I'd done that differently. But, you know, you just can't ever be perfect, can you? You can you can just do your best. Um, uh, I mean, we had an amazing experience with eggplant, for example. And, you know, we, we when we look back, we changed the software industry a little bit um, and changed the way how software is tested a little bit. Um, And we had, you know, we had a great exit. Uh, So a lot of good things happened. If I had my time again, uh, I mean, apart from not selling the business and timing it in the midst of COVID, which was, you know, 
I mean, I don't know quite how I, one could have predicted that, but you know, I if I had my time again, I would have waited a year, of course. But I think the key decision point for someone to to make is is this a good time to sell um and do you want to get out totally or do you want to stay in the business you know are your investors the right investors to take you forward for example is is one question um and is this a good time to sell and do you want to stay in because anything is possible and as i say we came to a strategic egg inflection point at eggplant um but i think you know i sometimes I, you have to have confidence, and I sometimes don't have enough confidence. My confidence has grown over the years, but you know, certainly at the moment, you have to remember there are not that many high quality assets out there, and there's an increasing number of buyers with an increasingly large amount of investment capital to spend. So one doesn't have to be hasty, and I would remind people of that. They probably sell too soon, usually, um, when people come knocking persistently, um, but we could well have continued but you've got to remember not to beat yourself up too much um, because there's often a crash or a downturn in the corner and for younger entrepreneurs they haven't been through one um, but I've been through the internet bubble bursting I've been through 9-11 I've been through the 2008 subprime crash um, you know what's next uh, if it's a bull market then you know, there's no harm taking a return, particularly if you can keep some skin in the game, um, because you may continue for another couple of years and get, you know, you uh, having built up, you may double the value, but get 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 half um, the return you would have got. So, I think remember your career is a marathon, not a sprint. Don't burn yourself out too early. You'll never be perfect. Um, and if you, your team, and the shareholders make out well, you've done your job. And if you change the world a little bit along the way, um, then you might even remember it on your deathbed. Although I think I'll probably be a bit more like, you know, John Maynard Keynes, who said, uh, when asked if he had any regrets, I only wish I'd drank more champagne. So I think that's probably probably more my approach. And do you uh, find me, do you think the future's bright for us going forward into this um, this post pandemic climate for software and tech in the UK? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I do actually. Um, I mean, there's I, I go back and forward between. There's going to be another roaring 20s, uh, which is a bit scary in itself because, you know, of course, that led to the biggest stock market crash uh, we've ever seen. But, you know, uh, that notwithstanding, it wouldn't be too bad to have a roaring 20s. And I do think there's tremendous pent up demand. But I also worry about what happens when all this furlough is removed and what that's how how much is it propping up an edifice? And I'm also worried about, I mean, this chilly shallying around about you can travel, you can't travel, you know, uh, and what that's doing to certain industries, because there's a tremendous, it's not just the airlines, it's a whole ecosystem. And the UK is a very service oriented economy. And this backwards and forwards business, um, could cause a lot of damage. But generally, I've come to the conclusion that, yes, it's going to be good. And I just hope everyone can hold it together until we get out. Um, and I think government needs to be a little bit clearer and a little bit stronger and have a bit more of a thought for business, my goodness, because um, they have some parts have suffered so much. John, it's been an absolute pleasure to spend time talking to you. I love people who give opinions, um, you know, to hell with the rest of the world and what they think. Um, you know, from a business perspective, it's probably what we think every day, but you've just voiced probably what millions are thinking, but just haven't put foot forward. So thank you very much for your time.